Coming up on Texas Parks and Wildlife. Alligator hunting is its just not like anything else I've ever done. I don't want to get anxious, get excited, you get nervous. So I'm going to take my alligator meat. I'm going to make sure it's nice and full. But you want to leave enough room so that you can take the ancho chili and wrap it back around the meat. If there aren't any burn bans, minimize your campfire's impact by using established fire rings. We have every kind of bill. We have electric bills. We have water bills, dumpsters that need to be picked up. Texas Parks and Wildlife, a television series for all outdoors. This series is funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program. Through your purchase of hunting and fishing equipment and motorboat fuels, over $40 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year. Additional funding provided by Ram Trucks, Guts, Glory, Ram. is the J.D. Murphy Wildlife Management Area, and it's summer in the marsh. This is one of the best places in Texas to hunt alligator. Alligators usually have a small area that they'll use, so you can kind of keep an eye out and set your line where you actually see an alligator. Every September, a hundred or so lucky Texans get drawn to hunt gators here. The J.D. Murphy Wildlife Management Area is roughly 24,000 acres of wetland habitat. If you don't know your way around the J.D. Murphy WMA, it can be difficult to get around. Everything at times kind of looks the same. And it's in a part of Texas that a lot of people have not explored before. That's definitely the case for these three. Meet Spencer Burke, Scott Moore, and Terry Skull. Yeah, he was just right here like about a seven-footer, probably. The area that we're hunting in, it's a, it's a vast bayou of swamps and marshes with canals running through. The adrenaline rush is way more than deer hunting or, or anything else because you're after something that can actually get you. There's one probably about 10 foot and two seven-footers right up here. About 150 yards, we're going to try to put a set. Spencer has hunted gators before and is taking Terry and Scott out for the first time. Come up here trying to sneak up on some uh, alligators and see how big they are. See if there's any slides or tracks. You got to run right here. So yeah. he's coming, it's coming right up here. Well, we do alligator hunting because it's just something unique. It's different. There he is. Pretty good one too. We're out in sort of a harsh environment with the swamps, the mosquitoes, the alligators, the snakes. It's something you just can't do every day. I like this over here. It looks pretty good. Using a long cane pole, he's almost got it. The idea is to attach the bait to a roped hook and dangle it just above the water. How high does that look? 24 inches? No, 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 no. That's too high. That's way too high. If you put it too low to the water, the small gators will, will knock it down, or even turtles can get to it. That's good. Perfect. I think this spot's good. We've got the wind direction that'll carry the scent down the uh, canal. And uh, we've actually got a gator down there looking at us right now. Mr. Alligator's down there just waiting for us to leave so he can get snack time at 3 o'clock. I like it. Good job, Terry. <laughs> Deeper into the marsh, Spencer and Terry set up their poles. I don't know, kind of get excited. Never been gator hunting before. 
come out here and see probably 10 gators so far. You, you know, you see them on TV and, and uh, see the alligator shows, and this is exactly what it looks like where they're traveling in and out of. Our bait is chicken thigh quarters. Those smells savory. It's savory, that's for sure. Mm. And we let them sit out in the sun for a day or two, and they got quite ripe. Upwind's better than downwind when you get those things out. I like putting my bait about 18 inches above the water. Hopefully, we'll catch a little bit bigger gator. Oh, that hey, smells man. terrible. I offered y'all some of this stuff. Man, that is putrid looking, man. It stinks. That's going to get one. Yep. Hopefully, we've got them high enough where we'll get some big gators and we'll go see what we got when we get out there tomorrow. In September of 2008, Hurricane Ike bore down on Texas. The hurricane not only wiped out parts of Galveston and the upper Texas coast, about 100 miles to the east, a storm surge hit J.D. Murphy with a wave of salt water. It was real eerie the day after Ike. You know, you go out, there was no birds, there was no frogs, nothing. It was, you couldn't hear, it was just complete silence. It was kind of nerve-wracking. It killed alligators for months after, you know, Ike landed, and it just devastated the landscape. But over time, J.D. Murphy has recovered. Now this coastal marsh is back, prime habitat for not just alligators, but for wading birds and wintering waterfowl. Biologists gauge the gator population by checking nest success. Well, the nest is over here, and it looks like there's a few uh, gathered up over here. Usually they stay by the nest for quite a while. And these guys are days, if even hours old. Little bitty guys. Hard to imagine this guy getting 10 feet long. Oh, my net, they're going right through my net. <laughs> This year is the first year since Ike that things kind of got back to normal. Uh, we had more nesting uh, than we had in probably eight years this year. So that's a good sign for us. It's really neat to see them, not only just to be able to see all these little baby alligators and, and be here just moments after they've hatched, but just to see our numbers rebound shows that, that we do have huntable numbers and, and we have a, have a population that can support a hunt. It's almost like Christmas morning, being a little kid waiting for Santa Claus to come. You ready? We're all pumped up and, and ready to go see what we got. Woo! I had trouble sleeping last night. I was so excited about checking the lines. I think we're going to have some gators on this morning. Hey, we got one, guys. Oh, we got one? Yep. Ooh, he pulled out all the line, too. Here we go. He's not wanting to come now. Here we go. What do you think, he's seven foot? He's over seven foot. Oh, you're just anticipating, you don't know, really know what's on there. And he's pulling against you, and you're fighting against you, and all of a sudden he shows up. Well, that's a good hole, oh, yeah. <laughs> then it's on, then. When he sees you, you see him. I am amped up. Adrenaline's pumping. All right, Spencer, whenever you get ready. Santa Claus was good. <laughs> Looks good. No line left. In the end, it was a successful morning, as all three had a gator on the line. All right. Alligator hunting is its just not like anything else I've ever done. Hold on tight, Terry. OK. You know there's one on the line, and you start pulling me in. And I don't know, you get anxious, you get excited, you get nervous. Not happy. And you don't know if you're going to catch an alligator until you pull it up, and you really don't even know how big it's going to be. Hold on. That's big. His tail's on the, on the bottom. I can feel his tail kicking off the bottom. We were quite surprised today. We've got a, a good eight and a half footer, a seven and a half footer, and probably six and a half footer. Smile, smile, smile. One, two, and three. Excellent. Good job. This is a great experience. If you like to hunt and fish, or, or even if you know, you're just interested in something that's completely different than maybe anything you've ever done, I would recommend it for sure for anybody who hadn't done it.
Hi, this is Jeff Martinez from El Chile Cafe and Cantina in Austin, Texas. I've got an exotic recipe for you today. We're going to be using a little alligator. Now, most of the time when you get alligator meat, it's either going to be the jaw or it's going to be the tail. And if you can see here, I've got some alligator tail and it's got a lot of muscle running through it. So what I've done is I've taken the meat and I've ground it up in my food processor and that's what we have right here. And so what we're going to do with this today is we're making an alligator ancho chile relleno. I've got a hot pan here. We're going to start by adding some extra virgin olive oil to the bottom. Just enough to coat the bottom of the pan. Swirl that around, make sure it's hot. If you see smoke like that, you're going to know it's hot enough. We're going to add our white onion, which has been diced up. You hear that sizzle, that's what you want. Just like that. We're going to let this saute for about two minutes. And what you want is for the uh, onion to kind of lose its white color, kind of have an opaque color to it and almost browning at the ends. We're going to add our garlic and let that saute for about another minute. Oh, I can smell this already. It's already starting to smell good. All right. So then after that, we're going to add our tomato and let that saute for a couple of minutes until the tomatoes are breaking down. Now we're going to go ahead and add the alligator meat. Now you can use turkey, you can use chicken, you can use pork, just about any kind of white meat can be substituted for alligator if you can't find it. Still got kind of a pinkish color to it. You're going to want to let that keep on cooking until it loses some of that pink color. It's pretty much going to look the same as a cooked chicken. And it doesn't take very long. Alligator is a very lean meat. So the cooking time is minimal, and that's just about it. So we're going to add a little bit more flavor to this dish by throwing in some sliced green olives. That's going to add a little bit of a saltiness to it, a little briny flavor. And then we're going to add some of these raisins. That's going to add a little bit of sweetness to the dish. And we're going to finish it off with slivered almonds that have been toasted. That's going to put a little bit of crunch in there. You see everything in there, it looks great. There's a lot of color in there. A lot of color also means a lot of flavor. <laughs> and then we're going to finish it off with some fresh chopped parsley. That's going to add some freshness to the dish. And once you put that parsley in, you don't want to leave it on the stove cooking for too long because you still want that brightness, that freshness from the parsley. And then to finish it off, we're going to salt just to taste. And we are ready to stuff some chilies. We're using ancho chilies. That's a dried poblano pepper. So what I've done with these is I've reconstituted them in a mix of hot water and brown sugar, and I've let them sit for about six hours. And that's going to soften them up. I split it open. I took out the seeds, and I took out the veins. So I'm going to take my alligator meat, and I'm going to stuff it inside of the chili, just like so. I'm going to make sure it's nice and full. But you want to leave enough room so that you can take the ancho chili and wrap it back around the meat and make it look like it's never been opened, just like so. And I'm gonna set that into an oven-proof baking dish. Oh, this smells great with the olives, the raisins, the almonds, everything just smells fantastic in here. Okay, there we go, these are ready to go in the oven. I've got an oven set at 400 degrees. I'm gonna pop these in for about 10 minutes just to heat them through. So these look like they're just about heated through. I'm just gonna finish them with a little Honduran crema and I'm gonna garnish them right on top with a little fresh parsley. So this is our South of the Border twist on alligator. Enjoy. Texas is a beautiful state and we need your help keeping it that way. Imagine if every person who went out in nature left behind a trace of their presence. But it is possible to both preserve and enjoy the great outdoors. We call this Leave No Trace. First up, be prepared. Research the area you're visiting to find out what facilities are available. Check for burn bans and other restrictions. Make sure you have the right gear, and that includes being prepared for changes in weather. It's this way. Once you're out in the park, stick to the trails. The way. Going off trail tramples vegetation and disturbs wildlife. And going off trail could lead you into poison ivy or other surprises. Look for the tent pad or flattened area to put your tent. If there aren't any burn bans, 
minimize your campfire's impact by using established fire rings. Build only as big a fire as needed for the cooking at hand, and make sure to always douse your fire completely. If you pack it in, pack it out. Properly dispose of your trash in a dumpster or trash receptacle. You can also help the rangers by picking up pieces of trash that you find. Want some natural souvenirs? Take pictures. It's a violation of state law to remove resources from the park, things like rocks, plants, and other natural objects. Respect wild animals in their natural habitat and from a safe distance. Never feed wildlife. Human food is harmful, even deadly to wildlife, and can cause them to lose their fear of people. Okay, here they come, Dad. And finally, be considerate of other visitors. Avoid walking through others' campsites, keep the volume down, and respect the park's quiet hours so folks can enjoy the sounds of nature. Just a few simple things can make a big difference. Thanks for keeping Texas wild. Inside out, let's go! This is the story of a man who manages a state park. Good hit, good hit. Run, 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 run all the way through it! You ready? Get over here, get on the back. Todd Imboden is the manager. Well, Harry's just a coach. Throw it, throw it over here, Austin. Austin, over here. Coming at you, buddy. But that's not important. Woo! Go, 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 go! This is what's important. <laughs> Austin is the younger of his two sons. Go, 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 Austin, go! Yeah. Run, Austin! Run, Austin! Run, Austin! He's seven years old. Stay right there! That's Travis over there. For Todd... How am I at State Park? Life is a series of balancing acts between family... If you could unload them right there... And, and work. If you call it eight, then we'll take care of that. There are no easy answers for the Imbodens, but they are a team. Look here, pull them across, bend your knees a little bit. And like any team, they sink or swim together. Don't step up, just step out and swing. Don't have to step that knee up like that, just step out and swing. Okay. That boy, run, run! If your pants weren't falling down, you'd be doing good. Pull your pants up. <laughs> If we jump in front of him, it's kind of hard. <laughs> Travis and Austin's home has always been in a state park. Oh, oh, oh. Whoa! It's the only life they've ever known. When it's been the air, it gets me really tired. Oh. Their community of Oteen, Texas, is a small one, less than 100 people. And it's somewhat isolated, about 10 miles from Gonzales. That was cool. So while there may not be any grocery stores no. close by, the kids and their friends have but lots of things to do. But he, he didn't lose any legs or arms. Palmetto State Park is another area of distinctive interest being open for popular enjoyment. Hardwood, heavily draped in Spanish moss, and a wealth of semi-tropical vegetation make it a bower of beauty for the layman and a treasure trove for the scientist. Palmetto was constructed by the Civilian Conservation Corps. The stone buildings they erected are still in use today. It's almost like a little lost treasure out there. There's swamps in central Texas. Nobody knows this stuff. The lush vegetation that's here is just out of the ordinary for Central Texas. Now I can the catfish. Yeah, we're getting some perch too. But while others get to enjoy the scenery and beauty of the park, Todd gets to spend his days here. Okay. Doing this. We have every kind of bill. We have electric bills. We have water bills. Dumpsters that need to be picked up. Fuel, lots of, lots of gas. Then he has to factor in expenses and other costs most folks don't even think about. Perfect example of this is um, consumable uh, supplies, which would be like um, toilet paper. The average Joe doesn't think about how much toilet paper the park uses every, but we use a lot of it. 
Running a state park is sort of like running a small city. Todd has to deal with large infrastructure issues like maintaining water systems, roads, and electric grids. There are also the day-to-day -day chores like restrooms to clean, campsites to get ready, and constant barrage of fires to put out. In, uh, come on in. You got a minute? Yeah. What you Can want? you step out here for me? <laughs> Is it bad? So, with photos of Travis, Austin, and his wife, Annalisa, surrounding him, Todd must also perform another balancing act. There's my operating budget. That's it. That's all I got to work with for the whole year. One perk of being a park manager is that everyone thinks you're cool and you get invited to speak at functions and stuff. We have Mr. Imboden, who's the superintendent of the Palmetto State Park here in Gonzales. In bureaucratic speak, this is called outreach. Austin, will you stand up? This is Austin's dad. Good afternoon, guys. How are y'all doing? I was 20 years old. I didn't have a clue what I wanted to do or where I wanted to go. A friend of mine, he told me he could get me a job, and I thought, all right, I'm going to go get me a job at Parks and Wildlife. I showed up that day, and they gave me a janitor's cart to clean the bathrooms. From these humble beginnings, Todd's first state park assignment was at Bastrop followed by stints at San Angelo and Sea Rim. Now, as the park manager at Palmetto... <laughs> Y'all come on in. He's plugged in to the second grade speaker circuit. My name is Todd Imboden. I'm the park manager at Palmetto State Park. Some of you guys might know me as coach, and then some of you guys might know me as dad. I don't know. Just one of you, right? <laughs> This turtle right here is the one we're going to primarily talk about because this one is one that's in a little bit of trouble. This is a Kemp's Ridley shell. A long time ago when this little boy was just being born, this particular turtle got caught in shrimp nets. That's a big turtle, isn't it? See how big his head is? It's almost as big as yours. <laughs> Y'all need to line up quietly, please. Don't. <laughs> Here comes Mr. Bradley, look. There's no guarantee the Imbodens will stay here in Palmetto. From the shot. As Todd moves up in his career at Parks and Wildlife, and the family might eventually have to leave the life they've made in Central Texas. Well, that one is. But no matter where they end up, Austin and Travis can take comfort that when their dad goes to the office in the morning, He'll be working just a few blocks away. Where's Dad, Mom? Uh, he's right out there. Get ready. Go, 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 go. You okay? Yeah. Okay. I can beat a baby by a hundred miles. Well, you sure can. You are fast, dude. Okay. Palmetto State Park.
This series is funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program. Through your purchase of hunting and fishing equipment and motorboat fuels, over $40 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year. Additional funding provided by Ram Trucks, Guts, Glory, Ram.